All right, so next up we have colligative properties and solutions with electrolytes. So the previous examples we did uh, were involving a non-volatile, non-ionizing solute. Well, what if you have a non-volatile but ionizing solute where the substance, when you dissolve it in solution, breaks apart into a number of particles, more uh, moles of particles than uh, moles of the substance that you add to the solution. For example, take sodium chloride, dissolve it in water. Uh, for every one mole of sodium chloride that you dissolve, you don't produce one mole of particles, but rather two moles of particles. You have one mole of sodium ions and one mole of chloride ions. So remember, the properties of a solution depend not on the chemical nature of what you're dissolving in the solution, but rather the number of particles. So it says electrolytes dissociate in solution, so they have a greater effect on the colligative properties than non-electrolytes. Uh, nevertheless, the effect is somewhat less than expected because of some interaction or what we call association between ions in solution. So there's this idea that, yeah, when you put a substance in water like sodium chloride, that it completely dissociates. Well, is there a chance that some of the sodium ions and chloride ions uh, remain attached to each other? Uh, it is possible, and this does happen. So not every single ion separates from one another. So you do have uh, a degree of association uh, between the ions in solution. Uh, take a look on page 525. Um, and this shows uh, what's going on in solution. So for uh, the most part, you have uh, sodium ions individually surrounded by water molecules. You have chloride ions surrounded by water molecules. But there are, like I said, some associated ions that are surrounded by water molecules. So they're part of the solution. And so just know that not every single uh, one of the ions separates from one another. Uh, hopefully makes sense that the association effect is greater in more concentrated solutions. So the more solutes you have in solution, the greater the opportunity for those ions to stay uh, bonded to one another, attached to one another. All right, so we have something called the Van't Hoff factor. So anytime we're dealing with uh, solutions of um, electrolytes, ionizing solutes, and we're discussing vapor pressure, or boiling point, or freezing points. Uh, we need to consider the number of particles uh, that are in solution, and that's where the Van Hoff factor comes into play. So a symbol for Van Hoff factor is a lowercase italicized i. Uh, technically, it is the ratio of the actual colligative property to what would be observed if no dissociation occurred. Uh, take a look in the table on page 526, and we're gonna assume uh, anytime we're doing calculations of uh, freezing points of solutions or boiling points of solutions containing ionizing solutes, that the solution behaves um, ideally and that um, there is no association between ions. Uh, we'll do some examples where we do not assume that, but by and large, we will assume that there's no association between the ions. So taking a look, uh, first one listed there is a non-electrolyte. So uh, the Van't Hoff factor for any non-electrolyte is always going to be one. Uh, for example, for every one mole of sucrose that you dissolve, you're going to produce one mole of sucrose molecules in solution. Therefore, the Van't Hoff factor will be one. Uh, next up, I'm going to skip down to just sodium chloride. Ideally, the Van't Hoff factor is two. And again, uh, the reason why is if we look at the dissociation for something like sodium chloride, for every one mole of sodium chloride that dissolves, uh, you produce two moles of ions. So anytime you have a situation like this, uh, potassium bromide is the other example listed there, uh, the ideal Van Hoff factor is going to be two. In reality, it's not two, so we see that um, we have some different values there. And again, depending on concentration, so the uh, Van Hoff factor is lower for a more concentrated solution because of the possibility of more association between ions. Next up, we have potassium carbonate. Uh, for every one mole of pota potassium carbonate that dissolves, you produce three moles of ions. Therefore, the Van Hoff factor is three. So that's how that works. 
A little different problem though, take a look at the example on that same page at the bottom. Let me walk you through this one. I'll give you an opportunity to do one on your own. It says lactic acid is found in sour milk. Lactic acid is a weak acid. It's not one of the strong acids you memorize, so keep that in mind. It says it is formed in muscles during intense physical activity, blah, 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 blah. So weak monoprotic acid, therefore it is a weak electrolyte. The freezing point of a 0 0.0100 mole aqueous solution of lactic acid is negative 0 0.0206 degrees Celsius. Calculate first the Van't Hoff factor and then the percent ionization of the solution. All right, so uh, what we want to do is calculate the concentration. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set that up down here first. So to calculate the, what uh, the book calls the effective concentration, so based on the actual physical properties of that solution, uh, here being the uh, freezing point. So our change in freezing point is 0 0.0206 degrees Celsius. Uh, Kf for water is 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal. And so that gives us a value of 0 0.01111 molal. So to find the Van't Hoff factor, we're going to take that concentration, the actual concentration of ions or particles in solution based on the properties of that solution, and divide it by the advertised concentration, which was 0 0.0100. And that'll give us our Van't Hoff factor, which is 1.11. Kind of meaning for every one mole of that substance that dissolves, you produce a little more than a mole of particles, or you have a little more than a mole of particles in solution. Now, keep in mind for uh, any weak electrolyte, such as a weak acid, uh, the particles you have in solution are uh, the dissociated ions, so the H plus ions and whatever the anion of that acid is along with the unionized acid molecules. So you have essentially three particles in solution. Uh, all of those are going then to contribute to the uh, change in the freezing point or boiling point or vapor pressure of the solution. All right, let's take a look at the next part, percent ionization. So to determine the percent ionization, uh, we need to find uh, this. So we take the actual concentration of the ionized, uh, the, how much of the uh, substance is ionized, divided by the original, which was what was given in the problem. And that will give us our uh, percent ionization. So how do we determine the amounts that ionizes. We got to find that first. So if you take a look in the solution, I'm going to write a little different equation, uh, just a generic equation. So we have a lactic acid, weak monoprotic acid. Again, as I mentioned before, uh, ionizes, partially ionizes. So you have some H plus and A minus ions along with uh, unionized acid particles. And so kind of make, the book uses kind of like a SCAR table, how much of each substance you start off with, uh, how much the concentration of each substance changes by, and then how much you have, not really after the reaction, because technically this isn't after the reaction. So after ionization, maybe? Should we do that? After ionization. We'll just go with that. The book says start, change, and final. So you start off with 0 0.0100. Uh, before the acid has a chance to ionize, concentration of H plus and A minus are zero. Concentration of the acid is going to go down by some amount. Concentration of the ions are going to go up by some amount. And so after ionization, we have these concentrations. So now remember that if uh, the properties of the solution are due to all of those particles, so we need to add all of those up, all of these concentrations, and then that will be set equal to our um, actual concentration of the solution. So if we have 0 0.0100 minus x plus x plus x, we get 0 0.0100 plus x. 
and we're going to set that equal to our effective concentration, which we determined before was 0 0.0111. That was from uh, part A. And then we can solve for X, and X will give us the amount that ionizes. So in this case, X is 0 0.0. What does it say there? 0, 0, 1, 1 molal. So to find percent ionization, take the amount that ionizes divided by the original concentration. So again, in this case, uh, the original amount was 0 0.00, oh, sorry, 0 0.0110. 0 that was given to us originally in the problem. Take that, multiply it by 100, and we get our percent which happens to be 11%. So again, the key is understanding that uh, you have HA, H plus, A minus, all in solution, all uh, contributing to the change in the freezing point of the solution. Uh, the effective concentration based on the freezing point of the solution uh, is not 0 0.0100, but rather uh, 0 0.0111, and then we solve for X to find how much of the acid actually ionizes, and then we can calculate percent. All right, try one out like that. I believe that's like that. Let's take a look. 543, number 77. We're finding percent ionization. Go ahead and pause the video and do that now. All right, here's the setup. So again, first thing we need to find is the actual concentration of the particles in solution. Uh, I neglected to show the sky table, scar table this time, but uh, here's what we end up with. Again, it's always going to be something like this. Whatever your um, advertised concentration is, plus 1x is equal to the actual concentration of the particles in solution. Um, again, that X is the amount of the substance that ionizes. Take that divided by the original concentration and multiply that by 100. We get 12% ionized. All right, we're going to skip 79, I think, for now. Um, if you want to work that out, uh, you can. In fact, uh, if you want to work that out, go ahead and pause the video and I will give you the answer to that. So go ahead and pause now, and I'm gonna not show you the setup, but I will give you the answer. Pause now, please. All right, so it looks like our Vantov factor in this solution, 1.94. All right, so here's a, a more practical application of the Vantov factor. Um, I know this is not in your notes, so uh, maybe on the last page where it says soaps, uh, we can use that space there. So here's what I want you to do. Determine the freezing point and boiling point of a 1.00 molal solution of sodium phosphate. Uh, let me, uh, we'll do one together. We'll do freezing point together, and then you can do boiling point on your own. First thing is we need to know how many particles are in solution. We need to know the ideal Van Hoff factor. So um, take a look at the ionization equation for sodium phosphate. So for every one mole of sodium phosphate that dissolves, you produce four moles of ions in solution. So our Van't Hoff factor is going to be four. Now there's different ways to set this up. Uh, here's how I like to do it. So delta TF, so we're gonna calculate the freezing point first, is equal to I, the Van't Hoff factor, times KF, times the molality of the solution. Now, I have seen it before where you take the concentration uh, of the solution and multiply that by uh, however many ions are produced in solution. Essentially, what you're doing is calculating first the concentration of the ions in solution, and then that goes here. But uh, another way, just take the Van Hoff factor, multiply it by KF, multiply it by the molality, and you'll get your answer. So let's apply that approach to this one. So we want to calculate uh, change in freezing.
freezing point. So our Van T Hoff factor is 4. Uh, Kf for water, 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal. And the concentration of this solution is 1 molal. 7.44 degrees Celsius, that's how much the freezing point decreases by. So to calculate the freezing point, we're going to subtract delta T from the freezing point of the solvent by itself, and we get negative 7.44 degrees Celsius. So notice a much bigger difference in this case compared to if you have a non-ionizing solute where the Van Toff factor would be 1. If the Van Toff factor is a 1, as such as a case of a non-ionizing solute. In this situation, the freezing point would be negative 1.86 degrees Celsius. We have four times that here, 7.44, negative 7.44 degrees Celsius. All right, let's go ahead and calculate the boiling point of this solution. Go ahead and pause the video now. All right, we get a change in boiling point of 2.05 degrees Celsius. And so that means then the boiling point of this aqueous solution would be 102.05 degrees Celsius. All right, last up, we have osmotic pressure. Uh, first, let's start with the definition of osmosis. Osmosis is the diffusion of water or movement of water through a semi-permeable membrane in the direction of increased solution concentration. So water is going to move from an area of lower solution concentration to higher solution concentration, always in that direction, spontaneously. Uh, solute particles on the more concentrated side of the membrane get in the way, so less water molecules are able to pass through the membrane from that side. Take a look on 529. Uh, there's a good uh, picture here, and it shows what osmotic pressure is. So uh, typically, the uh, water is going to move, in this case, from right to left, pure solvent to where the solution is. And osmotic pressure essentially is the pressure that prevents that movement. So notice there's, uh, it shows on the left side, pressure pushing down on the solution to keep those levels of liquid equal. And so that pressure, whatever is applied uh, to the solution to prevent the net movement of water particles, water molecules from right to left, is called the osmotic pressure. So in the notes it says eventually the equilibrium of pressure is achieved. Um, and again, take a look at, uh, oh sorry, I was looking at 14.7 first, 14.17 on page 529. Going back to the page 528, uh, we see what's going on here. So again, uh, the solute particles are too large to pass through the semi-permeable membrane. And so only the water molecules are able to pass through. And so again, they're going to move from uh, area of lower solution concentration, in, the, in this case here, from pure solvents or water to uh, area of higher solution concentration. Uh, so water molecules, as you can see, uh, go from the beaker into that uh, apparatus there. We see the level of the uh, liquid inside that apparatus increases. Page 530 is a picture showing uh, what happens if you put a carrot in uh, sugar water, I believe it is, uh, versus in just pure water, oh, salt water, versus uh, pure water. And so again, you have diffusion of water either into the carrots, depending on what it's in, or out of the carrots, depending on what it is in. All right, so here is the mathematical formula we use for osmotic pressure. where pi is the osmotic pressure. Uh, that could be in atmospheres, it could be in tor, it could be in kilopascals. Uh, that'll depend on R. Uh, big M is the molar concentration, so be careful, we're not using molality here, but we're using molarity. Ideal gas constant R could be 0.0821. I've gave you more sig figs here for some reason. Uh, this is liter atmosphere per mole Kelvin. So if we use that, then this is going to be in atmospheres. 
If we use 62.4, then the osmotic pressure will be in tor. And of course, if we use 8.31, then the osmotic pressure will be in kilopascals. And then T is our temperature in Kelvin. All right, let's take a look at an example. It said, what osmotic pressure with a 1.25 molal sucrose solution and 14.2 exhibit at 25 degrees Celsius? Density of this solution is 1.34 grams per milliliter. All right, so first thing we need to do is to determine the molar concentration of the solution. So we're given the molality. And so uh, if you see in the solution there, it says you have 50 grams of sucrose. You gotta take that, convert to moles. So that's 0.146 moles. And 117 grams of water. So we gotta use the uh, density of the uh, solution and the mass of the solution. So if you have 50 grams of sucrose and 117 grams of water, the total mass of the solution is 167 grams. So use the mass of the solution and the density of the solution to find the volume, which in this case is 125 milliliters. Take moles of sucrose divided by liters of solution to get the molarity, so get 1.17 moles per liter. Plug that in with our ideal gas constant and Kelvin temperature. And we're using 0 0.0821 here for R, so that means the osmotic pressure will be given in atmospheres, uh, 28.6 to be exact. All right, it's number 85 on page 543. Go ahead and pause the video and give that one a try. So a little different problem this time. We are given the osmotic pressure. We're asked to calculate the molar concentration of the solution. So I just rearranged the equation, plugged in my values and got a molarity of 0 0.0558. Just like with freezing points and boiling point of a solution, we can use osmotic pressure of a solution to determine the molecular weight or molar mass uh, of a uh, substance. So take a look, we're given the mass of some solutes, the volume of the solvent that it is dissolved in, the osmotic pressure and the temperature. So we're going to uh, take all that stuff and we're going to, uh, you can calculate the molarity of the solution first if you want. So the book shows it's uh, substituting for molarity moles over liters and then find moles. At some point we need to find moles. So we can use that along with the mass of the solute to find molar mass. So calculate molarity first uh, using the osmotic pressure, the ideal gas constant and the temperature just like we did in the last problem. Take the molarity of the solution, multiply by the volume in liters of the solution, and that will get you moles. And then very bottom of the page there, take grams of the solute divided by moles of the solute, and you get your molar mass. So pepsin is an enzyme. These are rather large molecules. So don't be surprised at the molar mass being as large as it is here. Had one like this, question like this in Chem Honors, I think, uh, where the uh, molar mass was really big because it was, uh, we were dealing with a rather large molecule. All right, as I said before, we're gonna skip soaps, but if you uh, would like to read about how soaps work, go ahead and take a look on page 537. All right, that completes chapter 14, solutions. Thanks for watching.